Okay. Another question. You and I have talked a lot about kind of this push pull in her story and how much I've wanted to downplay her gender, given that she wanted to downplay her gender, but in the same breath, her gender was the reason that she was so often noted and written about and talked to. So how do you balance that part of your journey, being a woman in worlds that are oftentimes full of men? Ooh, gender. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let me answer this in a couple of different ways, uh, but also be specific um, or clear. Uh, gender does not matter in mountaineering. There's my clarity statement. However, um, there are differences uh, physically and psychologically between men and women. Hopefully, I am not the first person to bring this to your attention. If I am, I'm very sorry. So, um, <clears throat> if you go on a high altitude expedition today, women are probably 20, 25% of the makeup of that expedition. That's pretty uh, normal today. On any 8,000 meter peak anywhere, Nepal, mm -hmm. Pakistan, uh, uh, Tibet. And that's probably more than it was when she was climbing. Would, would you say maybe a little more? A little bit more, sure. Okay. Okay. So, you know, and I try to think why are those numbers so small? But a, a lot of it really probably stems historically because mountaineering historically uh, was really a male pursuit. And I think historically it stems uh, probably in one of two ways. It was either a, uh, a wealthy male pursuit mm -hmm. or it stemmed from sort of a, a military endeavor. Mm. And you see this sort of at the turn of the, uh, let's say the 19th century, uh, let's say the mid 1800s when, uh, well, you see it a lot uh, in the Great Game, where the British are uh, against Russia and um, uh, fighting over the, uh, the heart of Asia. And uh, they send out the military men who become, in fact, the first mountaineers to map unmapped areas. Mm -hmm. And they are very often the ones who these mountains are named after, um, Sir George Everest, okay? Um, Thomas Montgomery happens mm -hmm. to name K1 and K2, right? So that's mm -hmm. K for Karakoram. And these men um, are out there mapping unmapped areas because, you know, it's, it's basically a land grab, right? Mm -hmm. But they, mm -hmm. are, they are in fact um, military. Um, so, uh, and you find your um, surveyor generals and all this stuff as well. Um, but if you think about it, before I was even born, every 8,000 meter peak had already been climbed. And I think that's interesting because I like to look at that. Um, if you fast forward a hundred years uh, from the 1850s to the 1950s, you have um, Sir John Hunt, Brigadier John Hunt, <laughs> now on the top of Everest. So in the short period of time, the 12, if you get rid of the outliers, 12 mm -hmm. of the 14 8,000 ers were climbed in seven years by eight nationalities. To me, that's the original World Cup, the World Cup for countries to prove their superiority against each other outside of war. So it's a big wow. And UK takes two, US takes one, not the one you think they will because they fought for K2, uh, they went in 19, the US went in 1938, they went in 1939, they went in 1954, if you can imagine. 1954, they're on their way climbing K2 the third time and they hear it's actually just been, Everest has just been climbed for the British. So imagine the pressure these guys are under. If the Brits just got K Everest, the Americans better get that second highest. Mm -hmm. But who dies? Art Gilkey. So, ugh, right, there's so much pressure. But in those days, there used to be a situation where it's one permit per year. So they went and got the 1955 permit, but the Italians snuck in there in 54, the rest is history. But military, Ardito Desio ran it like a military campaign. 
So fast forward women, where are we? So outside of early women, and I know some people will say, oh yeah, but, but yes, they were wives of husbands who climbed. And yes, there's the outlying outlier, you know, who climbed also, but modern women, as we know it, climbed in the seventies. Mm -hmm. And Junko Taipei is a great example because she climbs Everest in 1975 and all the seven summits in 1992. 1992, so recent, right? Mm -hmm. It is recent. Now think about this. 1992. So women are starting to climb, other women will follow, but what do they need? What do women need to climb? They need money, disposable income. So let's just think for a second. Let's say in the 60s, they're burning their bra. Let's say in the 70s that they stop being typists and they go working nine to five. Suddenly they have disposable income. With disposable income, they have choices. Mm. With choices, they can now become and do and see what they mm -hmm. want to do. Players enter, all of a sudden. Enter our 20 to 25%. Mm -hmm. and, and there we have Interesting. our, Interesting. our new group. Yeah. So, so I like to say, um, you know, that, that they are equal. Chris and I being in industrial companies, primarily made up of men would not notice on, on the expedition that they are primarily men because they're men at work, they're men on the expeditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you pose a, a harder question, does it matter? And it only matters when it comes to things like sponsorship dollars. Because when it comes to a commercial proposition, it's important that women are recognized and seen as as good as men. Mm -hmm in these expeditions. And I think if Chris had lived, she would agree that that's when you have to step up and lend a voice and say, wait a minute, right. women are successful too. That's, right. the only time, that's the only time you really have to step up and say, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she lived long enough to be able to fight those battles. I would like to think she would have. I hope she would have. Yeah. That's the only yeah. time it really matters. Otherwise yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's the great equalizer, this particular sport.